Hi guys, well, it is just another yuck, gray, drizzly, dark and gloomy day here in the Sunshine State. Uh, here at the end of the road in the Point Lonesome Swamp in the Oasis of Freedom on this dreary, it is now a Wednesday morning, January 26th, and so... Uh, once again, I want to thank one of my lieutenants here at Collapse Chronicles. That is Brother Tom up there in the frozen wasteland of Vermont. Good Lord, brother. Uh, <laughs> how are your fingers even typing? But uh, I guess Brother Tom has sent me this uh, essay from Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera... <laughs> we won't get into uh, a rant about Al Jazeera, but they are one of the, you know, main, borderline mainstream media organizations that aren't completely clueless. And although they make it clear that this essay does not necessarily represent the editorial position of... Uh, Al Jazeera, they did have the cojones to run this, and just in case this battery runs out or you get tired of hearing me drone on, I am going to put the link on here so you can do this yourself, but if you just want to listen to me do this while you're doing whatever you're doing, I'll be happy to do this, and this was written by a fellow whose name I'm not even going to pretend to be able to pronounce correctly, from Belgium, Vijay Kalinjivati uh, is a, Vijay Kalinjivati is a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Development Policy at the University of Antwerp. And this is his uh, reading of the latest uh, form of climate denialism and hopium, I guess. Green gaslighting, another face of climate denialism. All the talk about net zero measures and climate resilience investments is just a mass deception. Okay, VJ. I'm going to call him VJ. What's on your mind, brother? <clears throat> we are living in a moment of our planet's history where carbon dioxide concentrations have peaked for the first time in three million years. Humanity is well on track to see an absolutely devastating temperature increase of more than 3C by the end of this century, which would drown coastal cities render soils in some areas uncultivable and produce even worse and more prolonged droughts, floods, and heat wave induced fires. Addressing climate change requires a profound transformation of global economic and political systems. This needed to happen yesterday, not 10 years from now. Commitment to immediate and comprehensive action should have been made at the much-awaited UN Climate Change Conference COP26 in Glasgow last year. Instead, governments, financial institutions, and corporations made pledges about reaching net zero emissions, building climate resilience, and ending deforestation. Yeah, right. <clears throat> While these terms appeal to desires for a modern and ecologically neutral society, they reflect 20 years of climate solutionism. We have a new word. So climate solutionism that has changed little to nothing beside filling the pockets of 
the wealthy. In fact, these words are used to obscure the climate crisis in an act of global gaslighting of epic proportions. So what is green gaslighting? Yes, I love all these new terms. Green gaslighting. <clears throat> According to the Oxford Dictionary, the word gaslighting means, quote, the action of manipulating someone by psychological means into accepting a false depiction of reality or doubting their own sanity. Close quote. There has been a meteoric rise in the use of gaslighting ever since the 2008 global financial meltdown. In its, in its aftermath, <clears throat> political elites spent billions of dollars in taxpayers' money bailing out financial institutions which had engaged in various speculative practices bringing executives and shareholders vast profits at the same time they imposed austerity measures that devastated working and middle class households while gaslighting them into believing that this is the only way to fix the economy. <clears throat> Today, the same tactic is deployed vis-a-vis -vis climate change, climate solutions that protect, if not boost, the profits of big corporations are deployed and presented as the only way to combat climate change. Quite often, these very same corporations are responsible for the environmental devastation leading to the present climate crisis. Green gaslighting goes beyond green washing, which constitutes the use of ecological themes as a marketing tool to cover up ecological harm of profit-making activities. Gaslighting does more than deceive the public. It also disempowers and undermines the potential to identify the root causes of climate change and ways to address them. In essence, green gaslighting is just another form of climate denialism. <clears throat> gaslighting over ecological concerns is also not a new phenomenon. Uh, anyway, guys, this is a long involved. He, he looks at some uh, historical examples of this. Uh, you can fill in by going on the link. <clears throat> the current political and economic powers dominating the planet are taking a page out of the same colonial playbook. Those largely responsible for the current environmental disaster we are experiencing are seeking to gaslight the public into ignoring this fact and accepting the continuation of a dangerous status quo as a solution for it. So now we're going to learn about the net zero deception. One of the policies that helps governments and corporations maintain the status quo is, quote, net zero emissions, which derives from the idea that carbon emissions and the natural processes of carbon absorption can be assigned value as carbon credits and traded. COP26 will probably go down in history as the conference of the net zero pledges. There were many of them from India's desire to be carbon neutral by 2070, 
China's by 2060 to the EU's goal of reducing its net greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by the year 2030 to U.S. commitments to cut their emissions by 50% by 2030. But these are all illusory climate action measures. Net zero emissions does not actually mean bringing emissions down to zero. Rather, it refers to a set of policies that aim to compensate continued emissions with projects that, and I'm going to put the word supposedly, absorb carbon elsewhere. These policies are supposed to help remove the extra emissions from the atmosphere through measures like tree planting, enhanced forest protection, and of course, costly carbon capture and storage technologies. The problem is that evaluating compliance with net zero goals is extremely difficult, and so is proving the full efficacy of these carbon offsetting measures. For example, over the past 20 years of discussions about carbon offsets, no solid solution has been found to the problem of verifying in a transparent manner how emissions reductions are achieved. Furthermore, offsetting projects can have negative social consequences for vulnerable, vulnerable communities. The push for forest expansion, for example, could result in mass displacement of peasants and indigenous communities from their ancestral lands and into urban slums where devastating poverty awaits them. Corporations are already eyeing land in developing countries for lucrative carbon credit projects. In a report entitled Nature and Net Zero by none other than the World Economic Forum, yes, uh, and management consulting firm McKinsey and Company, the quote, economic feasibility of land around the world was mapped to establish its, quote, carbon abatement potential. The report assigns different values to different types of lands and estimated cost of realizing natural climate solutions projects on them. And uh, blah, 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 guys, anyway, uh, I, I can't believe that he's even uh, insulting our intelligence by putting all of this gobbledygook from a damn World Economic Forum report. Uh, so I'm going to skip over all of that uh, Orwellian doublespeak and move on to the end of it. Okay, <clears throat> this is his analysis. Needless to say, the report does not mention the potential social and human cost of displacement and the economic and physical violence acquiring such land is likely to lead to. Carbon credit accounting standards that are being set up currently require that a forest area be at least 25 million hectares, that's otherwise known as about 68 million acres, roughly the area of Vermont, to qualify for carbon credits. One can only imagine what a reforestation effort trying to meet this standard would look like and the amount of force displacement it would take to achieve it. Uh, the, 
Okay, anyway, again, guys, this is a log involved. Uh, the report, however, does make clear the potential for profit from natural solutions that can be monetized as carbon credits and sold to polluters. <clears throat> Governments and corporations have already jumped at the opportunity. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Leading the way on carbon offsets through forest conservation is the lowering emissions by accelerating forest finance, LEAF coalition, which in November announced that it has met its target of $1 billion in commitments to support offsetting projects. <clears throat> and needless to say, the, the, the coalition was launched on Earth Day last year uh, by the U.S., Norway, the U.K., and a number of corporations. It has already been joined by carbon credit buyers from Airbnb to BlackRock to Delta Airlines to Walmart to Unilever, Amazon, Monsanto, and Nestle. Yep, yep, yep. Uh... <laughs> oh, anyway, guys. Uh... All right, but just, just jumping ahead, the, you, you really, I mean, if, if you really want to get down into the meat of this, uh, th th this is a good read, uh, but I'm going to have to uh, to uh, jump ahead. Uh, so the bottom line for this chapter of this essay, the corporations would get the net zero label make their customers feel better about themselves, and also retain bragging rights about how they are creating jobs, the general public would then be gaslighted to believe that this is the only way to address our pressing environmental problems. Okay, the next chapter, Monetizing Climate Resilience. <clears throat> because governments and corporations know that they would never do what is necessary to rein in climate change, they have come up with a few terms to placate the masses. Climate resilience, climate adaptation, and climate mitigation, all of these refer to our supposed ability to respond to and deal with the effects of climate change and are based on the premise that humanity can actually pull through a climate catastrophe with minimal consequences while maintaining the global economic status quo. But Climate resilience, adaptation, and mitigation are no more than buzzwords that drive investment and profit. Unsurprisingly, they were prominently used at COP26, where one of the outcomes was the announcement of various financial pledges for, quote, nature-based solutions for climate resilience, close quote. These terms also feature in reports by economists praising the monetary value of nature and calling for investment in it. <clears throat> for example, a 2020 report funded in part by National Geographic found that the economic benefits of conserving 30% of the Earth's land and oceans outweighs the costs by at least 5 to 1. Yes. 
Um, anyway, uh, then he dives into that report. Uh, <clears throat> this absurdity, however, does not stop at treating nature as a financial asset instead of the sole guarantor of human existence and survival that it is. The climate resilience adaptation mitigation mantra is also used to greenwash industrial and infrastructure projects that harm nature. All of a sudden, proposed new real estate, airport, roadway, and shipping developments that increase the anthropogenic impacts on climate and ecological breakdown are being spun as green investments or climate impact investments. All they have to do is claim to provide climate solutions, mitigate climate change impacts, or provide sustainable living, and voila, new swish developments are given the green light. And uh, then he dives into that and gives some example is some examples in real life. <clears throat> Summing up, in essence, climate impact investing that is meant to build climate resilience is no different from investing in traditional asset classes as there is no way to, guaranteed, to guarantee that the sought-after impact helps nature or local communities. And just like the net zero emission slogan, it is simply a deception meant to make people believe that those most responsible for the climate crisis, rich countries, venture capitalists, and multinational corporations are in fact the most ecologically minded while COP26 illustrated the extent to which these deceptions have captured the global discourse on climate change, there, there are also signs that there is growing awareness of this ongoing green gaslighting. Uh, then, of course, uh, he, talk, he has to talk about don't look up. Less than a month after the conference concluded, the American film Don't Look Up was released <clears throat> on Netflix and broke the viewership record, <clears throat> making a clear reference to our climate disaster reality. Uh, again, uh, anyway, making an unclear reference to our climate disaster reality <clears throat> the motion picture po portrays the absurdity of how corporate and political interests hold back humanity's response to an extinction-level threat while actively gaslighting the public. We may not be facing an approaching asteroid or comet as the characters in the film do, but our climate change response must be just as urgent, and that has to start with resisting the green gaslighting that continues to waste precious time and tuning out corporate and elite-led solutionism. We need to stop centering attention on the false solutions the wealthy and powerful are offering and refocus on the plight of the ordinary people who are already suffering from the climate crisis. 
they're the urban poor peasants and pastoralists as well as indigenous people, their needs and struggles need to be central to a genuine ecological response that couples emissions reductions with degrowth. Living wages and dignified working conditions eliminates the use of fossil fuels and reorganizes the global economy away from neo-colonial land grabs resource abuse and underpaid labor and towards social justice. Anything short of this is smoke and mirrors. The people will not be fooled. Yes, and then Al Jazeera wants you to know the views expressed in this article are the author's own and do not necessarily reflect Al Jazeera's editorial stance. <laughs> anyway, so as far uh, as, the, as the climate subset of the real problem, which uh, Megan, Megan Siebert and uh, William Reese and anyone else with the brain knows is ecological overshoot. Uh, again, my main criticism uh, with this article uh, is probably be uh, Megan Siebert's criticism that they uh, that even this article uh, is still missing the big picture. Uh, but is but if you just kind of you know what I'm saying, you can extrapolate this out uh, to the real problem. Uh, the gaslighting, and of course, uh, you are not going to hear the word overpopulation or certainly overshoot anywhere in this article. Uh, I honestly don't know what Al Jazeera's editorial position on uh, reporting on overpopulation is, but I'm going to take a wild guess uh, that Al Jazeera's position on overpopulation uh, is about any other media's position, meaning it is never mentioned. Uh, but anyway, give them, uh, we're, we're going to give them uh, one thumb up uh, on that article. Thank you for trying Al Jazeera, but with that, I have got to wrap up today's Chronicle of the Collapse because I have to go pay some bills to keep uh, global industrial uh, civilization running here at, in the Point Lonesome Swamp uh, for the next few weeks before I bail out of here on my next adventure. I strongly advise you to get out there and keep global industrial civilization running in your own life while you still can, because it's going to suck like hell when this house of cards comes crashing down. Bye, guys. Nice little dog. You survived that.